This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and welcome to another episode of the Condo Insider. Everything you ever wanted to know about condominium living, owning, buying, whatever the case may be when it comes to condominiums. And today we have as our guest again, I don't know how they let you into the room, but we have Mr. Richard Emery, who is here to join us today on discussions of condo related issues. And first off, I'd like to congratulate you. I understand you've been appointed the co-chair of CAI's Legislative Active Action Committee. Well, that's correct for 2018. Now, a lot of people don't realize that there's several industry lobbying groups and uh, CAI, Community Association Institute out of Virginia, appoints a committee of about 12 persons each year to represent the industry before our legislature. What a lot of people don't know about that is the 12 members are equally divided between homeowners, vendors, lawyers, and management companies. So that the diversity on the committee that makes decisions on how to proceed with legislation is a very well-balanced uh, group of people. And in 2018, uh, Phil and Ernie and I, as a local lawyer, and I have been appointed co-chairs. Oh, that's good to know. And I know Phil and Ernie as well, so I think you two will both do a great job. Um, this appointment, however, for 2018 um, brings up the issue of there's a lot going to be happening in 2018 because what most people don't realize is that our legislature runs on a two-year cycle and we just finished a one-year cycle and a lot of bills were deferred, which means they may be coming up again in 2018. Do you have any speculation on what we may be looking at for 2018? Well, that's a four-part show in itself. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality, let me just briefly start this. We'll start the conversation that, that way. That yes, it is a two-year legislature, and and a bill that we promoted as an industry last year, along with owners, was House Bill 1499, that had unanimous testimony and support until the very end where it stalled in the last committee, the Finance Committee. So technically it's still alive, but yep. let me just tell you what that bill's about. I call it kind of a bill of rights for homeowners. Okay. When you look at people today, we have people being foreclosed upon because they got a fine or a legal fee related to a fine, and they basically, when they were getting the letters from everybody, basically ignored it and didn't do anything. And all of a sudden, they find themselves in a foreclosure lawsuit because we have a pay now, dispute later mm -hmm. provision on our statute. Well, this particular bill does not want to take the board's authority to foreclose if a person is legitimately delinquent under maintenance yeah. fees or other assessments related to the common expenses. But what it said was you can't foreclose on a fine or a legal fee related to a fine without additional notice and a notice to the owner giving a right to this Act 187 evaluative mediation. What it did is add another step to protect that individual who just doesn't understand their obligations under the condo law, and when they get a fine, probably ignores it and just throws it in the trash, and then all of a sudden they then are finding they're being foreclosed on and they have $5,000 in legal expenses yeah. because they just basically shined on all these demands. So this particular bill provides that more notice has to be given the owner and they have to be told of the right to Act 187 mediation and a right to participate in that mediation mm -hmm. before you can foreclose on a fine or a legal fee. Well, it's interesting you bring up the mediation side of it is I've actually helped a couple people who were having issues at their own condo association and I told them to request mediation and both times, a few months later, I get a message back from them saying, completed mediation, we resolved the issue, which is good to hear. Well, I think you may remember you did a show with me as your guest where I talked about all the statistics of mediation. Yep. And the original statute provided what we call facilitative mediation, which means the mediator can't take sides, it's mm -hmm. kumbaya, let's all get together. And they were somewhat effective, but not very effective. When evaluative mediation came into play in 2015, we used retired judges who can act more like a settlement conference mm -hmm. judge and can say to either party, 
if I was the judge, I'd rule against you and make you pay all his legal fees. So he can actually, these retired judges who have a great deal of authority with people and presence with people, can act as more of a settlement conference to somewhat put on the table and force a solution by being hard-nosed and mm -hmm. responsible yeah. based on what the law is and, and each of his obligations are. And, and that has an extremely high rate of success. Well, I think you and I on that particular show also looked at the statistics and found that those that were not resolved at that mediation did not escalate to litigation, which means that they, the discussion still continued, probably. Right. I, I, I don't hold me to the data. My recollection is that one out of five mediations didn't occur because one side or the other refused to go. Mm -hmm. And But then... They didn't pursue anything, and it, it got resolved, and the mediation request was withdrawn, yeah. which kind of sends a signal, let's not spend any money with a mediator, even though under this new Act 187, only the first hour you're responsible for, with, split by the two parties, are about $175 a person, and the rest is paid from the real estate uh, education fund. So we've seen a great deal of success, so the whole trend of the industry is to try to educate people about yes. alternatives and to get them to try this before they uh, go to the next level. And, and even those that were unresolved or maybe the mediation was withdrawn, you, we can still look at it as being somewhat of a success because it didn't escalate to litigation or anything like right. that. But back to your question, 1499 is hung up in the Finance Committee. It balances people's rights because the mediations we did have would tell you I want to say it's 30% had to do with enforcement of a fine or a house rule, mm -hmm. and those were almost all resolved satisfactorily. Yeah. That if we can give these people a right where some of maybe the rogue boards say, pay me first, I'm not going to do this, um, we get them in a format to try to resolve this as friends, recognizing that the bill last year, uh, if you get a mediation request and you refuse to go, either party, it may be considered a breach of your fiduciary duty. Yep. And, and I think it's interesting, you called it sort of like a um, owner's bill of rights for condo ownership. And just the last couple of days, I've been doing research on some other educational material, and I'm finding more and more states are actually passing bills called homeowner's bill of rights or owner's rights under their, their statutes. Well, no one's going to say any law, and certainly our industry has been around a long time, is perfect. Uh, there's been suggestions that we need to have some more government oversight <laughs> with respect to maybe, a, I think one of the bills two years ago called a condo czar, give them the right to overturn board decisions, and, and, uh, and they wanted the Attorney General's office to be responsible. But as the Attorney General testified back then, uh, they can't take sides, so you can't put the Attorney General in a position to take the homeowners over the board or vice yep. versa. It would be unconstitutional. So my suggestion has always been, let's take our existing laws, look for pukas or things that yep. aren't perfect, and try to find ways to balance the board's needs and the homeowner's rights, that there's fair processes and fair hearings to resolve disputes. Well, speaking of boards, um, Part of the Real Estate Commission uh, core, core, core course for 2017 includes a legislative update, which is predominantly condo legislation. And one of the areas that I get a lot of questions on, even after the class, I'll get an email or a phone call, is on Act 81 and the owner's right to participate at a board meeting. You know, that's an interesting bill, and we supported it as an mm -hmm. industry, because if you look at the bill, the law prior to the bill being passed, it said owners have a right to participate in board meetings. But what happened is boards would say, well, you only can participate in the owner's forum or when we want you to participate. And recognizing the owners when they buy in and have this duty to pay fees, maintenance fees, yeah. shouldn't they be able to express themselves? And so because of the vagueness in the original law, the legislature wanted to uh, clarify it that in any part of the meeting, an owner has a right to participate. Yep. And at any time, the board can set up, and they have to by law set up yes. regular meeting rules with, regret, with, regret, with respect to how the participation exists. So they can put reasonable time limits on it, and they can 
avoid an argumentative situation with a hot issue, because they have to get their business done. But when Act 81 was put into place, it basically clarified, and the CAI and ACCA issued draft rules for owners to use or boards to use to allow that participation. Well, I understand you also help participate in crafting those rules as well. That's correct. Because actually a copy that I have, I believe, is the one that you helped create. Yeah, Steve Glanstein and I, the parliamentarian, yeah. we had a short version and a long version. Which in some cases, like the short version, and we won't go into full detail of this because that's another show in itself, but even the short version pretty much covers it, basically saying an owner may participate in discussion of agenda items, and that's important to clarify, agenda items. Don't just walk in and start talking about other issues. At the meeting, at appropriate time as announced by the chair. You know, pretty simple. And I believe the time frame is another important one, because even when you testify at the legislature or the county council, they usually only give you a three-minute window there to, to speak or, or testify. Well, let me, I, sh I should have brought this letter with me, but let me begin by saying what I've always said to boards. You should always respect the owners and they have a right to be heard. So when you have an agenda item, we're gonna paint the building blue. Our policy is the board will discuss the matter first and we'll open it to the yeah. owners. So the board goes, no, I like pink, I like blue, and they talk about it. Okay, before we take a vote, do any of the owners wanna make a comment about that? Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your opportunity to share with you your point of view. Okay, now we'll take the vote. And that works with most non-controversial issues with boards. Sometimes there are more controversial issues that gets into debate and the, the longer rules proposed by Steve Blanstein address those more complex associations. But let me tell you about this letter I got where an owner filed a RICO complaint. It was about to file a RICO mm -hmm. complaint. I should let me take that. About to file an Act 187, a value of mediation complaint. <laughs> and they said, I went to my board and I showed them the law. And the board says, well, we have to go to our annual meeting and have the homeowners approve it first that, this, that we're going to follow that law. <laughs> I know you're laughing, but that's true. But what people have to understand is when the legislature adopted this law, it's law, and no matter what your bylaws say, your house rules say, or what you think, you have to comply with the law. So you have to, at a meeting, adopt meeting rules. Yes. And I recommend you put those rules on your notice of the meeting you put up around the project. These are our meeting rules. And then they come in and treat people with respect and give them a chance to be heard, because maybe the argument's about a $10,000 assessment. People are hot about that or worried about yeah. it. Doesn't it make sense to give them a chance to express their points of view? And, and be prepared for it. But again, like I pointed out, I believe it's on both your short and long version is the discussion sticks to what is on the agenda. Right. That's important for a homeowner to understand. It's not a moment for you to go in and, and gripe for, for 20 yeah. minutes about something that's not on the agenda. Well, first of all, most boards have a forum where you can, owners can yep. bring up other things. It's not technically an official part of the meeting because it's not on the agenda. But certainly, your comment about they come in and want to talk about this for 20 minutes isn't going to work. No. They should be able to come in and say, look, I'm really concerned. Uh, sprinklers are uh, going on my car in the morning when the lawn gets sprinklered. And can you have someone to think about it? The board would say, yes, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Let me talk to our resident manager or our management company about getting that sprinkler head fixed. You know, but it shouldn't be this lengthy argument and debate about things. And certainly, Boards have the right to have an executive session. So if they have a dispute between two owners or some other issue, they can keep it private by taking that to an executive session. Okay, well, we got to take a quick break so you can catch your breath. And when we come back, we're going to be discussing issues of finance and reserve. Money, money, money. Money, money, money. Okay, so we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion with our guest, Mr. Richard Emery. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. Number one on the list is who's gonna drive. It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose the DD. Captain of our team is the DD. For every game day, assign a designated driver.
Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Welcome back to the Condo Insider, and we're continuing our discussion with our, our guest, Mr. Richard Emery, and before we went to break, we were going to talk about money, money, money. Did you bring any with you? None for you. I didn't think so, but in any case, I think 2018 is going to be an interesting year when it comes to certain issues in regards to condominium funding, reserves, AOAO loans, and, and things like that. So what are your predictions or thoughts? Well, the, the hot topic is, you know, the, the fire at Marco Polo, yeah. right? And, and so the fire department has, and the mayor has put in a bill that's being considered by the council with regard to retrofitting of fire sprinkler systems. And no one really knows, there's about 360 buildings involved in this. No one really knows what the true cost of retrofitting is. And it's going to vary by the, how the building was designed, whether they have lead paint or maybe asbestos issues to deal with, uh, do they have a room for a 10 by 10 uh, pump to put the sprinkler system in? There's a whole lot of issues on uh, what we need to do to provide greater fire safety for people. And so the issue becomes money, money, money. So where's the money going to come yeah. from? Because even though we've seen some low, low old estimates of four or five thousand dollars a unit. Some people are saying it's thirty or forty thousand yeah. dollars unit. By the time you get the the pump room, you get the uh, soffits in to make it look nice. You put the system in, and you deal with lead paint and other type of uh, remediation you need to do to properly put it under the code. So I don't think anyone really knows. So when we looked at it as an industry, uh, CAI and Y Council Community Associations is going to put in two bills this year. The first bill has to do with, well, how are we going to pay for this? And mm -hmm. as I've lectured and spoken before, I can promise you government is not going to give you the money. <laughs> you, these associations are going to have to come up with the money. Granted, there might be some tax benefits that are passed by the council or by the state legislature. More for owner occupants because investors theoretically get some form of tax break anyway by filing it as an investment property. Forgetting that issue, just looking at paying the bills, the issue becomes where the money going to come from. Well, not everybody could handle a twenty, thirty, or forty thousand yeah. dollar assessment. Maybe not even a five or ten thousand dollar assessment. So associations need the ability to borrow money. Well, to borrow money you need fifty percent of the owner's approval. It's hard to get to 50% of the owners to do anything. That's true. So now you have, let's say, a mandated law to do something, and you have to go get the owner's approval. Otherwise, you have to assess them in cash. And of course, if they can't pay the money, you don't have enough money to pay the contractor. So the bills that we have coming forward are twofold. The first bill says something to the effect that if government laws or regulations mandate a safety upgrade to your building, that the board of directors has the authority to borrow the money without the owner's approval. That avoids all that cost of chasing people and going over and over again for written consents to our foreign owners. Because you know the worst case situation would be is they don't give you approval and then the association has to file a motion in court to get a declaratory judgment by a judge they have to do it anyway. Yeah. So you end up spending thousands yeah. upon thousands of dollars to do something that protects everybody's safety, but the same thing is mandated by law. So part one of the one of the bills going in says that the board of directors A has the right to borrow the money for this very limited government mandated safety regulation issue. The second part of that is homeowners often say, well, my declaration says inside these walls is my property. I'm not going to let you put the sprinkler yep. system or smoke detectors in my unit. This law further says. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the these high-risk components in the current law, that this high-risk safety issue, the board has a director to come in and make these modifications within the unit with or without your approval. Mm -hmm. 
Because otherwise, you get a loaner, you now want to put the system in, three or four owners get together and they sue, you can't do it, and you spend years, and again, tens of thousands of dollars fighting something that should be so obvious with respect to um, the, the sprinkler system. So under bill number one, the board would have the authority to go in the unit, and B, they'd have to borrow the money without the owner's approval under limited circumstances, which in turn would save the association a lot of administrative costs to implement. Well, that's, uh, that's similar to when um, associations were being approached to put a cell tower on top of the building or solar panels. The legislature passed and amended 514B to allow the board to make that decision without having to go get approval of a majority of owners. To do so, it's a similar type of scenario, really. And the second bill, which I was originally introduced, and in, don't hold me to it, I think it was 2004 <laughs> or 2006, basically for owner occupants, because as I explained, investor owners already have some tax mm -hmm. benefits. Owner occupants would have the right to take a income tax deduction, very much, maybe not exactly like solar, but similar to the solar credit where they'd be able to take a percentage of the deduction off their income tax if their association assesses them for a sprinkler retrofit and upgrade. Yeah. Well, and, and it's just my personal observation, but I think initially the bills that were being introduced, and of course expecting more to be introduced in 2018 at the state level, some of it was a knee-jerk reaction without actually sitting down and figuring out how this is going to be accomplished. Um, so initially it was like, we're going to have to do it and we have to do it in five years without actually thinking, how long is this going to take and how much is it going to cost? Well, and some of the estimates are this is a $400 million problem. Yeah. But then again, I was, had a chance to participate in one of the committees with the Fire Residential Fire Safety Advisory Committee. And uh, I was on the finance, how do you pay for this part of it? There was another part dealing with the code. They're following examples that originated in Chicago where the buildings have a matrix. They get evaluated. Even if they um, don't have sprinklers, they'll get points for having more modern fire doors, a better fire alarm system, whatever it may be. And they may accumulate enough points that they are exempt from retrofitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then some conversations have been that retrofitting will be mandated only for the common areas. Now this is still a work in progress, yep. so uh, I think you have to recognize going into this that the fire department kind of has to say the whole thing has to be sprinklered. But the city council will be the ones that will take these proposals and the matrix and financing and maybe tailor it to provide some relief for some associations. But I think it's uh, a long way. Uh, we, there's hearings coming up through January mm -hmm. on this particular issue. There's going to be a lot of testimony for and against. You know, so I think you're going to find that uh, hopefully a meaningful legislation will come out of it. Be candid with you, and I'm not an expert in this, but I've always basically said that mandating an increase to the current fire alarm code makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's much less expensive to do. When you look at the big fire in Dubai, which was like 60 stories, and they had sprinklers, but because they came up the outside of the building, the sprinklers didn't kill the fire. But no one got hurt, injured, or dead because they had the most modern fire alarm yep. system. So are we not better off focusing in the short run on mandating, that's already in the reserve study, it should be, yeah. um, upgrading the fire alarm system first as well as maybe fire doors and fire stop systems between floors where there's pukas from where the pipes go through and things like that. Well, the, the attitude on that is, let's fix what we can fix right now, and then we'll work on the other issues. Well, if you put it practically speaking, let's just make this up, that you have a building that has complex issues, needs a new 10 by 10 room, needs to have this, needs to have that. Let's just say it's $40,000 an owner. Well, that's about... $400 a month more to the owner yeah. if they had to borrow the money. Well, that's a lot of money for fixed income people. And what's that going to do to the rents for people? I talk about how the high cost of rents here. There is a price to pay for this, but also there's a price to pay if you don't have fire safety. So how do we balance those exactly. needs so that we can protect them when they get out in time? Because I asked the question in a meeting today. I said, you know, in all these high-rise buildings, there's fire hoses and 
fire extinguishers now. If you would ask the fire department, do they want you manning the fire hoses and the fire extinguishers? No, they want you to listen to the alarm and get out because they don't think you're <laughs> trained enough to do it, right? Exactly. It may be there for a small fire or something you can handle without much risk, but if it's a real fire, get the heck out of Dodge. Yeah. They don't want you there trying to fight it with the fire hose. So are we not better off? Because the, the current standard for fire alarm systems are, and that's where some people would object to it, is you have to have these enunciators in your apartment, including every bedroom. So if you have a senior who's hard of hearing, take a nap on a pillow, it will wake him up, right? And you can actually give instructions through the microphone system from the office. You know, go to the east end of the building or whatever. Well, that's a small inconvenience to have a little box on your wall up mm -hmm. in the corner, and it's a lot easier to install and less expensive than sprinklers. And then if you take the fire code today where they have to have smoke detectors in the common areas that are wired to the central office so the fire department knows what floor it's on and yep. where it's located, it seems to me that that's a balance that's affordable in the short run while we figure this all out. But to pass the bill after one major fire and sympathy to the families that lost loved ones in the fire. But there's more to this story when you look at the, the, the decades of experience we've had that it may not just be economically feasible to take old buildings and bring them to the yep. current code. No, I particularly agree on that, particularly on the fire alarm type of system. That's something that can be done now while we're figuring out the rest of the stuff. Well, certainly that's an important component mm -hmm. to the solution. You know, uh, I don't think you can rely strictly on the sprinklers. You need to have a modern yep. fire alarm system. Yep. I agree wholeheartedly with you, and believe it or not, our time is up already. Isn't it amazing how fast the time goes? It is goes? amazing how quick it goes. You know, <laughs> we could go on on some of these topics, put these people to sleep. We might be a good bedtime show. Yeah, there you go. A good one to have on after yeah. the Tonight Show or something but like thank that. Thank you for inviting me today. Well, thank you for being here today. And thank you, everyone, for watching The Condo Insider. We're on every Thursday at 3 o'clock. And be sure to tune in next Thursday for more information on what it means to be a condominium owner right here on the Condo Insider. Aloha.